Here we go. Um, the quote from today is from me. It says, uh, each of us is what we have allowed the world to create us to be. That, that by now maybe doesn't need much explanation. But if we think through the, uh, the models that we've arrived to with respect to having um, a lot of uh, processing and decisions done by our subconscious and then having our consciousness um, either automatically uh, let itself be guided by uh, those automatic decisions or uh, purposefully um, use the perspective process to make decisions approximating free will. Um, either way, you're living in a world that's going to influence you uh, one way or the other. Uh, some announcements. Final exam is on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday at 7.30 in S203. I put that in green to remind myself to remind you. As you already know, we have our subconscious makes decisions for us. So that, that morning when you come to class, some of you may find yourself coming here instead of down there. Thankfully, it's not too far. So, um, if you come here at that time, you end up taking it with an exam. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Uh, what to bring? Bring pencils. Um, you're going to be writing, um, maybe doing some drawing. Uh, and bring uh, white paper. I would bring just like you know, white printer paper or something, but um, I would suggest to bring at least 10 pages, not because I think that'll be more than enough. Not that I think you'll use all 10, but um, if you want to bring more, you're welcome to. Uh, whatever you do write on from the scratch paper that you bring, you're going to turn that into your paper exam. Um, and so what to expect when you arrive? Basically, when, once you arrive, I'm going to let you start the test. So I'm going to be here um, waiting for you, basically. And um, I'm going to give you a test. So once you come in, grab your test. And then uh, do your test. And then if you finish before the time is up, then bring the test. I'll see you uh, after the summer. I hope unless you're graduating. Um, and then I had asked last time if you could fill out that list that I have. I don't know if it's been done or not already. I don't really know how to check it. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if you haven't finished reading chapter 13. Missed it. <laughs> you should definitely finish reading it before Tuesday and reviewing those uh, chapters. We've covered a lot of these concepts in class, so I think maybe there's stuff in here. If you've read it and pretty much come to class, um, and you've done well on the homework, you should, you should find out of these concepts. Uh, this is what we're going to cover today the HSI model, which is the human version of the of, uh, pervasive computer uh, communications model, which was the OSI model. I'm going to touch briefly on mesh networks, and then we'll wrap up. In the wrap up, I'm going to ask for your participation. Um, but rather than just spring it on you then, in the event you find yourself daydreaming a little bit during our last class, you can day daydream about these questions. One will be any questions that you might have if you know, it's related to the finals, if it's related anything to the course uh, material, uh, anything you feel is an appropriate question. Um, but I would be interested uh, to get some feedback from 
from you here live as to what aspects of the course you found that were particularly useful, um, or um, what you wish would have been part of the course but we wasn't part of the course. If you feel like would have been a good, something good to include along uh, with it. I'm planning on, assuming I get good feedback and, and continued interest, I'm planning on teaching this in class again in January. So uh, this will be good for me. I'll take some notes and, uh, to make the class better for students to take next time. We covered the OSI model. Um, basically, if you're sending information from one computer system or phone to any other computer system or phone, or if you're writing software on for a phone or, uh, or a switch or, or a router or a PC or a Mac or electronic devices I haven't heard of yet, there's a pretty good chance that that system has been architected using the OSI model. So applications we talked about last time are things like browsers or games that you get to write. A presentation layer um, and all the way going down from the to session, transport, network, data, and physical um, are different layers that are responsible for doing different things. Um, so that each of the layers adjacent or below um, can get the information that they need to get in the format that they, that they need to have. And this model is nice because um, you know, generally, unless you're architecting a complete system from scratch, which doesn't typically happen very often. And you're going to be working in one of these layers, and you want to know what the capabilities are of the other, of the other layers. So you can reuse a lot of what's available uh, to you, and then make sure that you're um, doing things in a way that's compatible uh, with the other layers that you need to use for your application. So an example of this I gave last time was like the Internet of Things. Uh, the Internet of Things is a physical, tends to rely on physical interfaces of, of things that don't have a lot of a bandwidth or a lot of power. So they're not devices um, that tend to be connected all the time. And they are, you can't really handle a lot of data. So if you're making an application for uh, a smart light bulb that's connected via a Zigbee or ISA 100, or a variety of these types of standards, uh, you need to know that so that you're not um, thinking that you're going to be sending video to or putting video back at a very large rate. You need to do some things up in your application to compensate for the fact that that device is on a physical layer that doesn't have the capability to save a traditional network. And then in the OSI model, uh, the last part that's relevant for us, so this is the same OSI model, layer seven application, six presentation, five session, four transport, the host layers, the media layers being the network, the data link, and you can see there at the bottom, the physical layer. Um, within each of those layers, within any given computing system, there are a variety of instances of applications or physical layers or data layers or network layers. Your phone can communicate over a cellular network. You can communicate, uh, unless it's a very old, old, old phone, you can communicate over a Wi Fi network. You can communicate over a Bluetooth network. Uh, and it may uh, communicate over the NFC. Network. Uh, and then, even within each of those networks, cellular networks, you can communicate um, using different protocols. It could be a 
four G protocol, three G protocol. We're still even second generation protocol in some places that you might be using your device. Um, so that uh, I'm telling you this because this is analogous to a lot of what we've been talking about in the past. So, you know, when a computer has got a lot of applications on it, it's going to be a lot of processes, software that's running underneath it to provide services, connection services, services, or even services within that device. And that's kind of similar to the uh, to us as humans, because we are interacting with our environment by influencing the sensible energies that uh, either causing some modulation or not, or perceiving them through our senses. And we have lots of instances of that. So if our physical layer um, uh, relates to some physical mechanism, like a vibration, um, then our layer may be associated that some of the instances might be associated with touch, uh, or they might be associated with, with hearing vibrations yeah, in their area. So the model is the communication model, and because humans function basically as communication uh, beings with their environment, the model translates uh, well with some, added, some modest adaptations. So we'll use the same seven layers. We're going to change the name of the model. Uh, instead of OSI, Open Systems Interconnection, uh, we're going to, since we are going to make some adaptations, we're going to call it HSI for Human Systems Interconnection. Same overall concept, multiple layers, generally responsible for different that interface with adjacent layers or uh, The layers here are uh, layer seven, conscious thought, which will be analogous to the application layer. Uh, this includes things like self-communication as well as your emotional experience. So just like before, there's multiple instances within this layer of your consciousness. The layer underneath it is the presentation layer. It has the same name actually as, um, as the layer does in the OSI model. Uh, this is your simulated reality. This is what your consciousness is using um, to perceive the world. We call those two layers the host layer. Layer five and four, we're going to call those the mini module layers. Uh, we can borrow that term from Marvin Minsky. That's where your subconscious thoughts are and your subconscious processing. And this is really where, where most of your thinking is occurring, which is because it's the thinking that has to contract um, everything that you are doing and not doing right now. Uh, some processes uh, they, they function primarily towards the media layer the auto regulation of your body, and your heart rate, your lungs, and basically a lot of what, what's, what's going on with the happy function of the human being is happening without your consciousness uh, being directly involved or your presentation layer. So you're not really most usually aware of the bunch of So it's good that we have a bunch of super intelligent, well uh, learned many modules um, running all the time that have been developing since uh, before we were born and after we were born. Because there's a lot of stuff to track in order for us um, to have the luxury, if you will, of spending our consciousness um, watching games of Game of Thrones. If you had to uh, keep track of your heart all the time, you might not have the time or you want to just kind of uh, relax and, and watch a show. The media layers are, are the layers that keep track of what's coming in and what's going out and how to get uh, something to go get formatted in a, in a way that it can go out uh, or how to uh, 
transduce or format something that's coming in so that the subconsciousness and the consciousness can understand that. There we have the three layers, which are the bioelectric signaling layer that's moving information around through your body. The emissor or sensory receptors. Emissor just means you're doing something. Causing something to happen. It comes from words related to the word, the signal word you're emitting. So, memory communication things are going out, and things are coming in. Uh, and then occurrences, which are the sense of energies that we're modulating. You know, a sign model, that modulation might be uh, electrical energy on the antenna. Here, that modulation might be uh, light speaking. Uh, I added here an eighth layer. Um, it's called spirituality. And this is where I think it would fit in. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on divinity. Um, but if, uh, if you are a believer in, uh, in God or some uh, higher energy or spirit or, or entity, uh, you might think about how that go in. Uh, you might also think that maybe it's through all the layers. For here, for the kind of work I'm doing, um, another area is that draw on which AI or the people that are uh, in the religious industry, if you will, uh, that's where, where we say right now. So the idea is that uh, your interconnection with that other being is through your consciousness. <coughs> in part because it's that consciousness that really is the effectiveness and the, the advanced development of that consciousness that distinguishes you as a human being from other uh, species and other entities. That isn't to say that animals can't be spiritual. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but it is to say that uh, at least our consciousness, from a science understanding, is more developed. So even if animals do have a consciousness, it would seem to be more Yeah? Uh, just thinking about that, that this is an issue about the nature of the about the, the beautiful universe and the beauty. But he mentioned a quote in that video, which is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable. Uh, and it adds to that point of as advanced as we become, allowing us to have many more thought brings us closer to the divine, which is um, the ability to control or think about things. Of our reach and like we have more technology, the easier it is to manipulate things and less effort. So that's kind of fun. All right, so we're going to dig into this model uh, now. So now we're, we've shifted away from the OSI, and we're looking on the left at an entity. Is a human system, so for now we can think of ourselves. And we have these seven layers. Again, I mentioned the, the spirituality layer, but it's, it's not something that we can class. And I wanted to have it there in case some of you I do spend some time thinking about those sorts of things. And since we spent a lot of time talking about humans and humanity, then I'd like to see. Um, we have lots of instances um, at any one of these layers, and basically we communicate in between these layers. So, if we're not, if our communications aren't leaving our body, and we're thinking of ourselves as the entity we're describing here by the HSI model, 
then we can think of communications that may go from the application layer, the conscious thought layer seven, to the presentation layer. It's usually most of the communications that um, that go on, and then the next next ones may be going out side of our system, or they may be stopping within our system. I'll show you several examples of that. Well, that green's not showing up too great. Um, so the words there on the right say, typically aware of simulated reality. So this is what I was just alluding to, that our, a lot of our communications um, are basically in our, in our head. So we synthesize all these uh, perceptions and all these concepts from uh, layer four and layer five. Uh, we're accessing um, then me memories, by the way, since, since this is a layer model based on functionality, it's not based on implementation. When you think of things like memory and processors, they're all throughout that. You have some receptor memories. You might remember that when we did that, that Perusian flag. Uh, that wasn't, it had the wrong colors and then it had the right colors. You can also get uh, memory effects uh, in the signal as well. You know, they may stop signaling or they process things, pre-process things before they even get into the subconscious processing. So what these slides are meant to show here is that the green arrows are that our, what we understand reality to be is our layer seven processes and our applications interacting with our layer six um, presentation. So by the time layer six comes around, it's telling us, hey, this is, this is what, uh, I think Dr. Coleman was talking about, the brain that is sort of enclosed in this dark box. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on outside, outside of the body that is trapped inside. Um, it's best guess as to what's going on is what that presentation layer is presenting to the consciousness. But there's other layers, and so that's why there's still the concepts. Most of the concepts that are being created are concepts that you never get to see because they're being created in layer four and layer five, and your predictions are pretty much right. So if your predictions are right, and you're walking, and you're going up the stairs, you don't really pay much attention. If you miss that, then all of a sudden it's going to bring up that concept to your other you know, process, to your sending to your presentation layer as it is to your consciousness. It's a big what happened. All of the steps aren't even you know, it's a step missing or something. So that's how these communications work between the layers. And this works again even when you're wrong. So uh, if you have an incorrect concept, like you're hungry, but your presentation layers is telling your consciousness that you're mad, um, then you may, uh, may um, drive more of your decisions at a subconscious and conscious uh, construction layer as being related to being upset about something. So it's really important for your consciousness uh, to play an active role in sort of questioning what this presentation layer is presenting. So you can almost think of what you as a human being and hopefully the artificial intelligence system that you create is sort of watching um, uh, the world through really cool virtually virtual reality boxes and sound and and have to think that and everything else. Um, and it's got to, at some point, if it doesn't question what it's seeing, then you're basically living in a world. Because you're not an active participant um, in deciding the presentation. So if you remember from the perspective response process, uh, 
um, sort of the limit here is if you never allow time to progress, you never think about anything, really think about anything, you're just always doing things, and in some respects, you're allowing things to happen to yourself based on what you've already decided or your main models have already decided is important for you. And that's fine, you know, to the extent you live your life in a way that all these things are trained pretty well. Um, you can be pretty welcome. But if you want to be presumably an active participant in your life, um, then you have to work and really hard in your conscious thought and allow time to go by so that your new models for you have a lot that time to give you more options. Uh, they have time to create alternative realities. You see, I said, well, maybe he didn't say that because he's a jerk. Maybe he said that because he's hungry. Well, wait a minute, maybe I'm upset he didn't say anything bad because I'm hungry. So if you don't allow yourself time, whatever that first, whatever those first concepts are that come, are going to be basically what's driving your, yourself as a human being. Again, I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, if that didn't happen for the most part, you wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. Um, but if you have, you know, dreams, one of the things that's suggested is if you have dreams and goals, um, and you want to do things, you want to change the environment, you want to have a family, you want to have a career you enjoy, uh, all these things that you really need to, to be cognizant to train your brain uh, to be an active participant um, each and every day throughout the day as much as possible. And we learned from Lisa Feldman that you need to keep your body budget in check. So um, if you're not being active, and if you're allowing the physiological system to um, not keep in shape, that's going to detract energy from you that they could be using to drive your conscious thought. If you're not eating well or making sure that your nutrition is well balanced throughout the day, um, taking breaks from things that you're doing, all these things that you hear like they sound like tips, right? Self help books, and you write a whole self help book on any of the little things that I've said. Well, now what I want you to do. Um, to continue to improve these skills out in this class. Every time you hear a tip, like, oh, you should you know, um, do that to your neighbor as you would have them do what to you. Or, oh, you should eat seven meals a day, you know, seven small meals a day, rather than three big meals. Um, now you have models that you can go back to and think about, okay, if that makes sense, like, if that's going to help me at layer one, that's where I'm, I'm going to be an active participant to achieve my, my goals, whatever it is. Um, how is it helping me? What layers is it helping me? If your subconscious layers are sending you information that they think is the most relevant and you're in pain, then you can imagine that it's going to take away from them sending you information that has to do with things that don't have to do with the pain that you're in. And so if you take anything away from this class and, and the thing to take away is that um, you as a human being when you're uh, going through whatever it is that you're going through um, can use this model to help you maybe sort things through um, then that would, that would be something that it would be a good accomplishment. So some other examples there, the perceptive illusions we saw in the dirt effect, um, where uh, different instances are basically competing to interpret, and it can go one way or the other way, depending upon which one is dominated. Um, we love that effect because um, when we moved it to the moving dots, remember the moving dots, I told you the dots are not moving. Not going to move. So your consciousness uh, was doing the absolute best that you possibly do because you knew the answer. And after you saw it the first time, and I showed it again, you still needed the answer, but you still saw the dots move. 
why is this important? It's important because um, sometimes as humans, we may believe that we are in 100% control of everything it is that we do, decide, think, see, feel, do. Um, but part of, of, um, of giving up saying it's no one can change, no one can change in the world. Um, I don't know if you can change the movie dots, actually. If you want to um, do an experiment, you can try it every day for three years or something and see if you can get back to the point where you don't see them moving anymore. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know. My guess is that you're probably going to see those dots in there unless you somehow train yourself to get something else compensated for that. Um, so there may be things that are just so well learned or, uh, or architecturally uh, processed at a layer um, far beneath the consciousness that you may not be able to get access to the change very much. Uh, but what you can still do is be aware uh, that something that you're seeing may not be actually the way it is. So you can just acknowledge, hey, you know what, there might be sometimes where I'm seeing something and I, might, I just don't have the ability to, to know that what I'm seeing is not really actually happening. It's only happening in my mind. Or you flip that and say, maybe there's some times that I can't see something that's there, either physically, literally in front of me, or conceptually when someone's trying to explain something to me, and I just, I just don't get it. So I might be out to say, well, it just doesn't make any sense, that's why I can't get it. Or I might be able to say, you know, I just, I just can't get it. It makes sense. I just, I can't figure out a way to make it make sense for me. So now let's go, we're still talking about a single entity, whether it's an artificial entity or a human entity. Um, and we're talking about conscious thought, presentation, and now the subconscious layer. And this is, the subconscious thought layer um, relates to a term that you hear called bias. And I think I mentioned um, class before a uh, technique called flip it to test it, which was trademarked by a friend of mine that, that works at the head of human resources for brothers and sisters in Switzerland or something. Um, she did a TED talk uh, on it. It's a tool basically to help you recognize that how pervasive bias is and whether or not you're participating um, in the bias. And so, in some respects, it's challenging because language suggests when you hear the word bias, um, that it's bad. What I'm gonna tell you right now is those two things are not equivalent. Because artificial neural networks, inherently, and by definition, are biased. They have weights, they have connections. And then they don't have connections, and then the weights are different. So the reason an artificial network even works in identifying something in the image is because it's biased. And so when I read articles in the common press that say, what can we do, you know, artificial networks, we've got to get rid of the bias in them. Um, as a scientist, now you all have a better understanding how artificial networks work. Um, and understanding how humans work, you, your takeaway should be, well, no, <laughs> if I get rid of the bias, then I'm never going to get an artificial uh, human intelligence system. And if I don't want bias, I can't use um, an artificial network. It's inherent. At some point, I'll write an article on that and put it on my video. Um, just haven't gotten around to doing it. In the summer, I'm planning on writing some more. So, those of you who are interested in learning more, keeping up to date on the 
field, um, you're more than welcome to reach out on some you know LinkedIn, some you have already, but we have to accept you as a, a, a colleague. Um, so, so when we say bias, we remember that unfortunately that's a concept, it's a word. People attach different meanings to that word. Because I my original training, my undergraduate was as an electrical engineer. Bias to me fundamentally means the voltage I put on the circuit. So despite the fact that I also know it means um, that I'm treating someone unfairly, um, I think of it actually more as sort of leaning one way and another way, which is where that is really where that originates from when you say being treated, you know, because of being associated with this group, it's because you have a concept that's making associations. I'm not saying bias is good. Um, if you've noticed throughout the course, I've tried to avoid virtually at any point in time saying that anything is good or bad. That's, that's up to you guys to decide. I think be presumptuous to tell you um, something you think or a way of thinking is good with that, or it's something that you'll decide based on whether or not it's helping you achieve the goals that you want. If the bias is not helping you achieve the goals that you want, um, recognizing that, that the biases you have are good because they help you the thing and spend time watching Game of Thrones. Uh, then you need to consciously sort of reprogram this subconscious to not allow it to, to take over. Um, I will tell you, the older you get, the more experiences you have. It's not an age thing, it's the more experiences you have, which tend to happen the older you get. And the harder it is to, um, to change the, that lifelong learning that has caused all these mini modules to to be how you like to you be know, for the most part in the lab. So I don't know what the Spanish word version is. In English they say you can't teach an old dog a trick. Do they have that in Spanish? How do you say it in Spanish? It wouldn't be literal if you said it. <laughs> That's right. If you think of it, it doesn't matter if it comes to you later. But that you can put it in uh, whatever comes up for you can put it in the uh, So remember, you just heard a saying, what does it mean? It means you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So if you put that in here, what are you really saying? You're really saying that the older a person gets, the more um, developed and sort of rigid that the subconscious processing and subconscious thought becomes um, so that if you want that old dog to learn new tricks, they have to consciously, actively, sort of almost continually combat the, their natural tendencies, which came from themselves throughout their life as they allowed the subconscious layers to develop. So if you say, you know, someone that grew up uh, in a family that maybe uh, tended to have a lot of uh, racial prejudices in a community where maybe the people that they usually interact with had racial prejudices. And that person then moves to another area where there's more diversity. Um, you know, do they have a bad heart? What opportunity did they have to have all this years and years and years of subconscious processing and subconscious thought develop uh, in a way that makes it easier for them to not be biased, or to not be racist, even if they don't want to be? It's hard. Not making excuses. I'm just when you see people that are in situations and you're like, how could they possibly think that way? Um, for the most part, you can actually kind of figure out how they think that way. If you think through a model like this or that that, that we've been using or the other models we looked at in class, 
because you realize that they formulated their all these mini modules based on the experiences that we've had, which is based on the environment that they did. Um, so this gets into some philosophical things where people say, okay, well, what, if, what about communities you know, that are disadvantaged because uh, economically they're disadvantaged? Because there's a lot of crime and schools don't have the same resources. Well, those kids are still growing up, time still passing by. Right? What are the experiences that they're getting? If they're getting most of their uh, experiences from parents, uh, who want them to succeed and they're spending all that time with them, um, then that can help to offset the time that they're getting experiences from maybe other people in the community that aren't necessarily have the best interest in mind. So if you want to change the world, which I'm not saying all of you, uh, but if you want to change the world not only for the better of you, but for the better of other people or other groups, um, or maybe for your kids or your grandkids if you decide to have some. These are some of the problems that you have to think about how you solve them. And how do you solve them when everybody around you has experiences and many modules that are completely different than yours because they didn't necessarily train statistically, uh, improbabilistically to be the same. They can't be the same. Even if your brain started the same. And I think that kind of makes sense uh, to you now. If not, I can answer questions or debate the concepts of these models that we've put in place based on the science that we've um, gotten and learned throughout the course. It's tough. Biases are tough. Um, I'll share a, a personal story. I can get a little philosophical today. Last week. I'll share a personal story. I was at a dinner last night um, at one of the places that was originally recommended in the class. And I was there with my wife initially. Usually we like to sit at the bar. Not because we're out of us. But you should know me now good enough to know that I want to talk to the people that, that work at the restaurant. I want to talk to the bartender. I want to talk to um, the people that, that serve the tables and they're going to come to the bar and get the drinks. There is rarely a restaurant that I have been to even one time where I don't know where I haven't met people afterwards. And if I've been there twice, like, I know their names, I know things about them. My wife taught me that. My mini modules going to MIT as an undergrad and getting straight A's were really screwed up because they were overly developed in a very specific way that made me really, I think, a pretty, um, pretty poorly prepared to do much of anything. Even work in a corporate environment. So I didn't have the social skills or understanding um, to, to really appreciate that to be successful in solving the technical problems. I needed to get to know and, and, and the people that I work with. I needed to help them be successful so that they would help me be successful. I didn't learn that at any class. So the, the lessons that you're learning here. Um, even when they get to be more psychology oriented or philosophically oriented, couldn't be any more important to your career in software, computer science, uh, management, business, human resources, whatever it is that you decide to do with this class. And I can that you get from here. So I can tell you that this is hard stuff. Uh, in my vision of the world, um, the types of things that you're learning now are things that we teach our kids when they're in elementary school, teach them when they're in middle school, and teach them when they're in high school, so that they realize that um, emotional thinking and logical thinking um, are at least equivalently important, 
if not more so that the emotional thing is more. That would be my thought. So I'm at this restaurant. Um, I usually sit far from the screen. So we, we sit underneath the little umbrella because it's outside. And I start to hear the conversation of the person behind me. Not because I'm eavesdropping on their conversation, but because they're really loud. Uh, they're speaking in really good English. Which over here you get that sound that does much. Usually you're hearing people on the west side hear a lot more Spanish conversations. And I started to hear this person, and it, it didn't take very long before I didn't like this person. I didn't even see, I didn't even see this person. Um, it wasn't that they were talking loud. Uh, it was that over just a very few minutes of talking loud, they managed to inform me through their communication that the most important person of that person was themselves. Because they were in a group with four other people. And he was talking loud, which is one thing you do in a group if you want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, but it's sort of assert authority over a dynamic. Sometimes you talk in a lot of words. You also don't really let other people talk. And I can't, so out of his mouth came the word I, because I pay attention to this thing. No less than 10 times in like three minutes. I, I, oh, and I did this. Oh, and then when I talked to him about this, I realized that like, didn't even know what he was talking about. I, I, I. And then after a little while, I would start talking to my wife. And then it would happen again. I, I, I. It's there he did the second thing, which is anytime he referenced someone who wasn't him, there was nothing positive to be said. And it didn't matter if the person was talking about their students, faculty members that they worked with, or administrators at the beginning. I still didn't know who this guy was, but I figured out very within the first six minutes that he worked at a university. Now, my concept was that maybe they were visiting from some other university uh, because it seemed like everybody at the table um, seemed like. Yeah, where I don't know, it seemed like their English was as good as mine. It seemed like English was, was more comfortable to them than, than Spanish. Uh, and it seemed like they didn't really look at Latin. It seemed uh, more, more Caucasian, more, more like someone I, I would see. I still remember that. I proceeded to hear about um, sexual harassment cases, about this student who is dating this other student. I'm sitting here in a public place listening to all this stuff. I finally um, pieced together who I think the person is. And then when we, and, oh, and then at some point I have to tell my wife, who already knows me, and she knows that we're going to be looking at each other. And I am listening to everything that's going on. And I'm in shock. I proceeded to find, I'm not going to tell you who it is on this. Find out that they, they actually have a, a significant position of authority in education at the University of Puerto Rico. It's just like put a hole through through my heart. Right? Um, so then I looked online and I thought, okay, maybe they're just having a bad day. Um, I pieced together that they had been maybe at some interesting dissertation and pieces. They were all there talking about this. It's totally, and you, you, you don't know the issue. So I pieced this all together, and then I went and saw a video of a person, and they had actually spoken at a TEDx talk, which is still pretty cool. And it will not surprise you that in the first three minutes of that TEDx talk, that person proceeded to say, ah, I did this, and then I thought about this, and then so I put this together, and then I realized this. And if you look at this, you might see this. I realize that this is a new way of doing this. Not surprisingly, the TEDx didn't have a lot of views. 
Why am I telling you this? That's what I break down because I'm not telling It's a judge free zone. I still don't know. I have a little bit of information. Um, but I want you to realize that, that even the people you know that you may look up to because they know a lot of stuff um, may not know this stuff. So try to keep this in mind. Um, when you're feeling bad and someone's making you feel bad, right? meaning that you're feeling bad, you're allowing yourself to feel bad based on the things that are around you, recognize that, that that person, as educated or as experienced as they are, may, not, may be like I was when I graduated from MIT. I didn't have a clue about anything that didn't have to do with computer science and what you want to do. But maybe they haven't had the conscious awareness of it, or it's the old dog being tricks, right? Or it's not that important to them, so they have to really focus on changing. I haven't decided what I'm gonna do. You know me, you know, you'll know well enough that at some point, I'm gonna to talk to this person. I'm not gonna send an email to their boss. I'm gonna have a conversation with this person. I'm gonna say, look, you may not, do you remember me? Which way I'm supposed to? You may not know this, but, I know like a lot of things going on in your department because you told me these things. Because you're if you modulated the sensible energies <laughs> at a volume that and you frankly created a topic that I was interested in for my class the next day. That's how Beatrice knew that we were gonna be looking at each other in that time. All right, so now we have a building. And at some point, that's going to be an intelligent building. Right? And a lot of buildings today have some level of intelligence. Um, if it's near construction, something like this, they're going to have sensors embedded throughout the, the, the walls and the infrastructure that are reporting information as to movements, stresses, and things like that. That way, if the building actually is, is Starting to move, um, then the, the building is going to intelligently recognize that. Hey, it's, you know, my concept is these sensors should be moving and on. And we'll learn some way to see what's going on. Bridges, most uh, new bridges in the United States, at least if they meet certain requirements, have to have these types of things embedded within them. But even if it's just a building, you know, we can look at it so it's going to be. Um, and when it does that, I apologize, let me flip this back. Um, when it does that, it's getting to our consciousness, maybe we're paying attention to the building. Maybe just to the subconsciousness and subconscious thought, our presentations layer is not presenting it to us in our consciousness because it doesn't think that we care about it. But if I was an architect and this was in the city, my subconsciousness probably did put it up to my mind to say, let me look at those buildings. Maybe even the one behind it. If it started to fall, even I, as a person, I'm not really architecturally oriented, um, my layer four and my layer five are going to cause my layer going to cause my layer six to present and my layer seven. This thing to do. I'm going to start paying attention to that. Kind of like what they say in the states if someone yells fire, um, the reason you're not supposed to yell fire unless there is a fire is because it's one of those words that's pretty much going to cause everybody to you now have sort of um, panic and concern and tension as they're living or seven, regardless of what they might have been doing before. And then, the crying wolf example, I don't know what it is in Spanish. Say there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, and everybody runs, and then when there is a wolf, you say there's a wolf, no one runs. And you already know now how that works, right? It's pretty programmed. Your subconscious processing, your subconscious thought, have figured out that, that it's a hoax. Whip. So it's not likely going to let that through unless there's some other reason to let it through. So what I like about this model and the models that we've seen before in class is that there's rarely a saying that someone tells you. 
it's not like sounds like a good idea that I can't actually explain based on this, on this model. And that helps me when I'm trying to figure something out, um, whether it's to implement something in, in code or implement something in life, to think that through. Okay, so now let's look at systems that, uh, at the top it just says that each HSI model, so I'll leave that thing for you. Um, so now, if I am a human being and I want to communicate effectively to another human being, all I have to do is make sure that my conscious thought is sending the information that I want to send as accurately as possible to the conscious thought of the other person. So that's all I have to do. I have to do it even if they have a cell phone. What happens if you do have a cell phone or they're thinking about their cell phone that's next to you? How do I know that? Maybe I do make a call. Maybe I can guess that they are or not. If I keep seeing them grab their cell phone, I should realize that whatever it is that I'm telling them is important. I should wait. But the way I thought I should tell them whatever they're saying. But I would presume that whatever they're doing is not about that. It's my wife, I have confidence now to say, this is what you did. Sometimes it's not. She would rather hear me communicate something that it's me and it's me that I thought about. She wants to make sure she understands. Sometimes it is. So then I go, yeah, we talk about it or we talk about it or we did it or something like that. Right? Um, recognizing that you know, someone else uh, may be not consciously really thinking about what it is that you're saying or doing what it is that you're showing them is really important. It happens in this class every day throughout the class. There's not a single person in this class that has the ability, I think, to consciously process every single thing that I say in that class. And I don't want you to. Because you're, I want you to, you're going to growl. There's some things you're going to hang on to more than others, and there's going to be some things you need to think about more than others. And I want you to drift off and start thinking about and then hopefully come back for the next important topic, you know, get that learning. And then if you really miss something or want to get it again, then look at the class slides in the video. That's why I put that up. So it's part of the learning is why we do the things that we did in class. I'm sure you guys have never done this, but it could be the case that you're really not paying attention to the other person. They're there, and you can kind of hear it. And the test for this is when they say, you're not listening to me. You say, yes, I am. You just said this. But you didn't really hear them. That's just like in your, in your subconscious memory, presentation layer borderline, and you just were sort of like saying that you got out of it. But you weren't really listening. It's there, but it's not really in your conscious thought. And then imagine that if you're spending a lot of time not really in the moment, and you'll hear self-help terms like meditation and mindfulness and stuff like that, which I love it, but I like to put models and physics and science behind it so I can understand what they are. Mindfulness, what does that mean? That means that you try to keep your conscious thoughts in that moment, that you use time in order to evaluate what it is that your subconscious is telling you and what's happening around you. In some respects, that, to me, that's how I can understand what my purpose is. And if you want to take it uh, to a power level, you can start tuning off some of your sensible energies. So you're not paying attention to a lot of the things you're not paying attention to. And now your mind is going to process more information that's coming from inside. Uh, hopefully by now, something like mindfulness and why meditation is good or has Good benefits for people. You can explain that in the concept. 
of this class. The models that we use in this class. So keep in mind that if we are not mindful, then we are we're literally just and the people I'm working with aren't mindful, which they aren't most of the time, or they're not a lot of the time, then a lot of the interactions aren't really getting good enough to that point where where you wanted to be if it was something that was important to you. So the lesson here is really if it's something that's really important, um, think about that you know that you, that you have to work at it. And you know, the person that you're with has to work at it if you want to get all the way to the top layer. It's not that they're a bad person, so you got a lot of layers to work through to get information from one person to another. So going back uh, a little bit more here, um, you can imagine it doesn't even get to the presentation layer. I mean, it's just it's a conscious layer. And then you can imagine that maybe you're at that layer. And then you can imagine that your subconsciousness are talking to other people all the time. Um, you do it when you have your arm around someone and you're talking to them. After a while, you're not going to remember that you had your arm around but your subconsciousness is aware of that. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to uh, mesh networks and thankfully there's only one slide. Um, I showed you, you know, one layer seven, layer one, going out through layer one back into someone else or some other entity. It didn't have to be a person, it could be an artificial system, or it could be two artificial systems learning from each other. So if you want to do something really cool, uh, research GAMs, which some of you have looked into, and think about creating seven layer GAM, where the two entities can basically teach and learn from each other um, things about the world around them, things about each other, build concepts, minimize errors. You wouldn't even have to be around because you put two robots in a rare box and like, come back and see, see what happens. If they're holding hands and hugging, then we'll export that program into the room. If one of them's out, then we'll start over. Um, this is just showing that there's different ways that we can connect to each other. With mesh network, if you think it's hard enough to talk up to one, we use more of a star technology in class. Not to say I'm a star. I'm and it's basically me talking to you, except when you all glance at each other and talk to each other sometimes, uh, which means it's a real mesh approach. Okay, so I've actually already given you a lot of my closing thoughts, so we have some time left. I would like to now tap in for any questions or things that you found especially useful in the course. I want to make sure they don't go away. Uh, or things that you uh, wish you had covered in the course that, that we didn't. Yes. But I, I hope that that's something that you, not even just these models, but I hope that, that that's something that you find is a useful tool when you're um, trying to accomplish something. Sometimes just sitting down and seeing if you can sketch it out on paper with a, a model for it can help you sometimes figure it out. Yeah, 
I'm glad to hear you say that. Actually, it was, it was, I feel like it was necessary to, to have that be like the main curriculum course. Um, but I can tell you that some other people uh, didn't like that. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's, in, in my mind, it's because I felt like I could get through the technical stuff throughout the class because you, don't, you're, you have so many technical classes already that you're building on that you have. Um, and I didn't really know how to get get to that without having something that you can do from someone who's And that can be great on this ability to become something that's missing in the course system. But like the course system. That's because I wanted to have you appreciate, because um, I think this is one of the toughest people for, things for human people, human beings to realize just how um, how much of their, their daily lives is basically just being reactive to all, all the things that are happening. Um, and so I wanted to try to create this awareness of that so that when I presented this slide, I felt like if I presented this slide early on, you know, that it's many modules or something that's separate from this consciousness that could have been pre proven. Now I'm in control of myself. I'm totally aware of everything around me. I control everything I do. Um, I do experiments on myself to, to check some of these things. I decide I'm not doing something. And then I see how well I do it. I can see, you know, all the exceptions. Oh, I'm just doing it because my parents do it. I do it because they made me do it. So I don't want to feel bad. So I, I, I look at all this type of stuff. So I, I am going to do that, actually. It's a good suggestion. I haven't really thought about it yet. So I think it's a good idea. And maybe the way I'll do it is by having that, using that application so that you can see that there's a tool that. Um, I think at least that's a tool that, that whether you have a lot of programming or not a lot of programming is still useful. I was actually surprised to find out that some of the people that do a lot of hardcore classes here didn't know that was there. I think they probably still use them too. So we just have some Now, if I did that for the future, that maybe could be the first one. Um, I think I'll go back and look through the slides, but I'll definitely we'll do it earlier. Um, most of you seem to, to do that homework. Let me see if there's anything else. So this is not <laughs> the quote for the day. <laughs> Um, and so I'll give you, uh, let's see, 
we got three minutes of philosophical thought to I mentioned this before um, early on in class, but right? I was new to you, you know, I'm here because I, uh, several years ago, um, I had gotten to the point in my life where I, I really I had all the things that I wanted. It wasn't that I had everything, maybe I'm not, I'm not that old. But I had the things that I wanted to have, I could do the things I wanted to do, go to places I wanted to go um, to. I knew I had a bunch of kids go to college. Um, and I had already challenged myself and started some companies and um, helping some people in technology and business. And, you know, and I, I was trying to figure out. Uh, but I was frustrated in a sense because um, all the news was bad. People were getting killed in schools. Um, you know, and since that episode I showed you of Connecticut governor, you know, how many times has it been something in the news, right? <clears throat> and people, you know, leaders of the free world and leaders of the not of the free world and the not free world. Everybody in between, uh, and even just you know, yesterday, uh, uh, the department director somewhere here with me. Um, I realized that that, um, that they're not really. I don't think that they're that everybody's really that aware of, uh, of themselves and and of others. Because the reality is that it's rare that kids are friends. I meet mean, a lot of people. Um, and I befriend a lot of people because I like, I like doing that. Because I have a material objective of it and I, I enjoy it. Um, when I meet people, it, it doesn't really matter if they have a lot of money or a little money or you know, work hard or don't work hard. I mean, people, for the most part, if you're one on one with them, they, they seem to be pretty cool. For the most part. Every once in a while, I meet, I meet someone that I just don't connect to. But I'm usually trying to you know, see things from other people's perspective and um, look, frankly, for, for the good. Um, and my thought was, well, how, what can I do? And I envision myself you know, forward in a lot of things. Imagine if I was the president of the United States. One, I can never be present. Trust me, I've done a lot of things in my life, and they were tough. <laughs> um, two, even if I was present, I still couldn't do what I wanted to do. I still couldn't even help this. Uh, so after giving it a lot of thought, uh, I realized that this was, you know, obviously bigger than me. And that the only way that this could ever happen is if we figure out a way to get this type of education into the school system. Um, so I uh, invested in developing a curriculum for youngsters, uh, which has not been deployed uh, yet, but it's fairly well developed. Uh, then I realized that to get into any middle school, unless I own middle school, uh, was going to be an uphill battle for this. Especially in the US, and lots of things very political, just like you have here at the Red Party and the Blue Party and the Green Party and other parties. Uh, same in the states, you know, on a local level. So people don't you know, want to teach this because you know, that's kind of, it's really more of this party is going to be so I don't want to teach that. So I had to kind of make it. So basically, we made a curriculum that was agnostic. So that's why you hear me a lot of I don't like to say good and bad. The decision is good or bad, the anger is good or bad. It's up to you. I'm just trying to make people happy. So, the way I thought to do this was that I had to teach class at a university somewhere. Um, that was a very technically oriented class um, that would insert this, this content where it could be helpful. That's where the seeds came from for creating this. Um, this class, and I needed to do research with students to 
you know, development concept so that you can establish the credibility, publish, present work, and start in that direction so that um, it became easier to teach these sorts of things. Um, and so now I don't have to say, hey, kids need to learn mindfulness and have a parent say, well, isn't that Buddhism? I can say, you know, kids need to learn um, seven layer all for human based communications. And if they're technically engineering minded kids, IT minded information technology kids, which we want, we feel like that's very important, then they need to learn this in the context of OSI and artificial intelligence so that they can keep up you know, with the engineering groups and the like, talent groups that are going to be required to make um, cool systems and technology. So with that, um, I do want to thank you for being part of the journey to make humankind human again. Um, and I challenge you as you go through your career here, your careers elsewhere, and you're with your families, with your friends, and you meet people on the street, um, to think about how you can engage that person as a human being. I'm going to leave you with one little short story. There's this restaurant in Asu, in San Juan, it's called Asu San It's my recommendation. It's a little pricey, so if you tell me you're going, I know the chef. Special occasion, prom, I don't know if you'll do those things. There's an equivalent in college. Asu San, A-Z-U-C-E-N. Um, and the chef of that is an incredible Person. I met him just because I go into the restaurant and I sit at the bar. It's not hard to um, But because it's a good restaurant and I like the people at the bar and I've gotten to know him, I've gotten to know him because he sees how much we appreciate his food. Uh, and he's trying new things, he brings them out. Uh, or he gives us portions because, as my wife says, he did it and put it out. So he means well. <laughs> There's only so much we can eat. Um, so this just happened, uh, let's say about three months ago, I started to see my place. Um, I have a, a place over here, we we'll go to San Juan to eat, we cut down paradas and uh, one of those green things with the points on it, guanabas, um, nails, platinum. We just take stuff and he loves very creative. Um, so we, we became friends, but I actually had never seen him anywhere other side than, than the restaurant. So my wife told him last Friday, he worked too hard and she came out west and stayed with us. Um, and his wife, his uh, girlfriend, and him actually came out. First time they'd ever been out of the restaurant and seen us. And they stayed with us at our, our house. Very relaxed. Very relaxed. And we were gonna, they wanted to go eat some restaurant in Hong Kong or something. It was closed on Sunday. And his girlfriend said, Well, I know this, I remember this place when I was a kid that has fresh fish. It's just a little guy behind the house in, in Mani. I've lived in my Westford Walk now, I didn't even know this existed. And it was in true form, like it was a little wooden sign with some paint on it. And this guy was like behind the house of the house. And there was fresh fish. The best meal that's ever come out of my kitchen, Beatrice, my wife, would drink, <laughs> was Sunday night. Enjoying a Sunday night was a couple that was looking for a place to get married from Colorado that we met on Thursday night. Who told us they were coming to the West Side? Come to the West Side, you know, hit us up. You should definitely check it out. We invited them to come up. Yeah, everybody had a wonderful dinner. I got pictures. And at the end of the evening, the same period, that's what you do. And then we married them. Not for real. <laughs> <laughs> but my friend, the chef, Camacho from Asusena, says, You guys should get married tonight. And I'm thinking, Well, you know, I think. You know, like captains in the sea, chefs in Puerto Rico, I think 
they're allowed to learn. <laughs> and we literally like put on a wedding there spontaneously recorded it. Best experience they've had, best just a phenomenal experience I had. Best meal that came out of my kitchen, almost zero planning. Uh, but how do you get to that point? Is really just from, from trying to, to be in that consciousness when you interact with them. When people give you opportunities, so they're, you're always saying, no puedo porque. Always. You're, you, that's probably a cue, just like if you're always saying, I, 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 I. That you're maybe not, your consciousness, maybe not uh, taking the time it needs to, to really think about whether. You will find a little less things. Sorry to keep you over. Hope you found it useful. Thank you for your class. Monday, office hours only if and when you ask for them. So I'm not going to be in my office sitting here. I have carved out the whole day. So if you are studying in something and you want to come meet with me Monday, you have to let me know by Sunday. If it's an absolute crisis and you let me know Monday morning, I probably need to do that. Thanks. See you.